This is the Internet Report, where we uncover what's working and what's breaking on the internet and why. I'm Angelique Medina, and I'm here with my co-host, Archana Kesavan. Hey, guys. So lots of interesting stuff happened last week. So there was the um, tension between China and India, and this happened around the same time in which the um, apparently uh, India decided to ban around 59 Chinese-built apps, among which was uh, TikTok. Right. Uh, Mm-hmm. So the, the, it comes from, there was a military uh, dispute among, uh, wherein about 20 Indian soldiers were killed uh, sometime in the middle of June. And following that, India decided to ban about uh, 59 Chinese um, applications. And, you know, just like you mentioned, TikTok was one of them. And But there are a lot of users in India or have been um, that have been using TikTok, right? Something right. like more than 600 million downloads of the app. And then of course there was also other TikTok, TikTok news that was also related to um, you know, the political situation. And that was TikTok has pulled out of Hong Kong. Um, TikTok is a Chinese um, uh, company, but it's not available to users in mainland China. And now it's no longer available to users in Hong Kong. So some interesting, um, you know, news about, you know, how kind of the political situations in various countries are impacting um, what's available to users um, from a content consumption standpoint. Right. And and we might want to keep an eye open on how the U.S. is going to handle TikTok as well in the upcoming weeks. Uh, I I saw something earlier this morning today that indicated that the U.S. is also considering um, shutting down TikTok um, because of growing concerns. So stay tuned for that. And then, of course, I'm, I'm sure um, a lot of folks heard about the almost two and a half hour uh, GCP outage in U.S. East 1, right? A couple of right. zones that were impacted. Think, um, so U.S. East 1 is the South Carolina uh, region. Hmm. It's, it's not necessarily their most popular region. The Ashburn still is. Uh, but uh, the U.S. East 1 um, had... had especially services hosted in availability zones, uh, two of their availability zones, uh, which interestingly is almost 66% of that region. That particular region only has three availability zones and two of them were out for, you know, more than um, two and a half hours. So that was uh, B and C that went down? uh, C and D that went down. C and D. And yeah, and what's interesting is that, you know, I mean, the whole point of availability zones is that there's some... Um, separation in terms of, you know, whether it be um, connectivity or power. And when they later reported that it was a power outage that took this down, that was a little bit surprising because it suggests that they actually had shared resources and maybe, you know, redundancy is not, um, you know, maybe that's something you need to factor in or think about if you're building out redundant architecture. Right. I think the whole concept of availability zones, right, and how every provider lays them out um, can be unique. And yeah. one of the things that we discovered in our um, annual cloud performance benchmark report, um, the 2019 report, is that there was some variation in terms of uh, interavailability zone latencies. And some regions when GCP or Ali Cloud, Alibaba Cloud were, were really small. So it always raises that question uh, when you think about availability zones as to um, how distinct are they from a resource consumption perspective? Are they physically separate or are they just different floors within a data center, right? Right, right. Um, Yeah, you definitely want to be asking those questions because to your point, I think there's a lot of assumptions that the way that the cloud providers work is somewhat uniform, right? So when somebody says they have an availability zone, in one cloud provider, maybe that's handled differently in a different cloud provider. And the same on in terms of networking constructs, which is actually what um, uh, we're going to talk about today. We have a great um, guest, um, Atif Khan from Alkira, and, and one of the things that he talks about is just the difference in the networking constructs between the providers. So always good to understand how your specific cloud provider operates. Right, totally. 
Um, and talking about outages, I think um, Slack released a more in-depth root cause mm. analysis of uh, an outage that took place uh, in May, I think May 12th. Slack had almost a 45 minute outage um, starting at 4.45 uh, Pacific, so towards the end of a business day. Um, but that kind of took down, you know, um, connectivity to Slack and was kind of um, a, a global blast radius um, of the outage. So you can read the detail analysis, but in short, it turns out that um, there was a bug in their load balancing uh, infrastructure, which kind of derailed a sync between their yeah. proxy and their web app tiers that you know affected um, the platform and, and right, pretty good right. write up there. Yeah, it's a great write up and kind of details how you know the, effectively the the mapping was not um, you know properly working at the time mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. even though you know the application itself was up and running, the assignment of instances was um, was malfunctioning and because of that you know. Right. Users weren't able to use, many users weren't able to use the service. We actually go through this outage in depth in our, um, in episode eight. So, you know, if you're interested in that, feel free to um, check that out as well. Yeah, great. I mean, you know, overall, like from an outage standpoint, and just in looking at like, for example, network outages last week, they were down overall. So we're starting to see numbers that are closer to what we saw in February, um, which is good. Although, you know, outages are kind of a fact of life if you're operating um, a network and particularly a large network. And we did see last week that Comcast had pretty notable outage that took place on July 4th during peak usage hours in the evening. And this amp impacted um, multiple regions in the United States. So central, east and west. Um, and that's where we're gonna take a look at um, uh, next. The extent of the outage, Angelique, as you were saying, it, it originated, started out in like the, the Midwest and then spread across to the east and um, the western regions. Yeah, that's right. So it started around or just after 5 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, so this would have been, um, you know, I guess like 3 p.m. Um, uh, so, oh, sorry, 7 p.m. <laughs> Chicago time. Right. So 7 p.m. Chicago time, you know, we see that their um, infrastructure is impacted in Chicago. Um, so this is their backbone. More of their backbone with the eye bone in there, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting is that it's just, a, it's not contained to Chicago. You know, a few minutes later, we see that now the impact has kind of um, expanded. Okay, so the first, you know, 10 minutes or so is Chicago. And then... Oh, here we go. Okay. So um, first five minutes, Chicago, and then we see New York, we see San Jose, and we see Seattle as well pop in. So this then kind of just persisted for um, some time. I mean, this was like a 30 a minute outage. Long outage. Yeah. yeah. Um, and again, you know, we're talking about really important um, uh, kind of peering points or transit points, New York, you know, San Jose and so on, um, and then just kind of continued on, you know, and this is, you know, regardless of which time zone you're in, this is, this is probably something that you would have noticed, um, you know, assuming you weren't out like watching fireworks or something like that, <laughs> um, uh, in which case maybe you wouldn't have, um, but, you know, pretty, pretty notable outage, not only for its length, but also just for the, um, the number of locations that were impacted. And, and some, an outage like this is typically um, caused by either a misconfiguration or something that's impacted the control plane. You know, it's not like a router just died, right? right. Um, because it's multiple locations. So, um, you know, I haven't seen anything on this um, from users or from Comcast. So, you know, it would be interesting to see if anybody um, else noticed it and, uh, and if Comcast had anything to say about that. So that's um, kind of the highlight from this week in terms of um, an interesting outage that we caught. So that was our notable outage last week. Um, we talked a little bit about resiliency given what happened with Google last week in terms of multiple availability zones uh, within a particular region going down. Also with the IBM cloud outage, it's been a topic that's come up a few times over the last um, several episodes. We had Jason Black from Uber come on a few episodes ago to talk about their um, 
their resilient cloud architecture and the strategy that they have. Um, so we thought we'd continue this conversation and invite Atif Khan, who is the CTO of a multi-cloud networking startup called Alkira. Um, Atif is also the, um, previously was the founder or one of the founders of Viptela. So he has a lot of background in um, enterprise networking and works with a lot of um, enterprises to help them kind of implement a, um, you know, a very flexible kind of agile networking strategy with their cloud providers. So we're really excited to have him on and that's up next. Thanks Atif for joining us. Glad to be on the show. Thank you for having me. So what about traditional enterprises when they are contemplating um, moving to the cloud or maybe even some kind of hybrid or multi-cloud strategy? First of all, why would they do that? What's, what are sort of some of the drivers for embracing multi-cloud for an enterprise? You know, that's a very good question, Angelique. Um, so there, there are multiple uh, reasons why uh, enterprises are uh, adopting multiple clouds. Uh, one is like a pretty uh, uh, simple and straightforward where, you know, each cloud is different from uh, what they offer. Right. So in, in certain cases, uh, uh, one, one cloud offers uh, something which the other cloud doesn't offer or your application in one cloud runs better or uh, one cloud is more suitable for a certain type of application uh, than the other. So, um, uh, uh, so you choose the cloud based on that. Uh, secondly, um, cloud uh, redundancy is, uh, is one of the major uh, factors as well. Uh, the third uh, reason which we're seeing uh, uh, out there, uh, some of the large enterprises which we are working with, especially uh, what they, they started uh, with uh, one cloud, uh, mm -hmm. but they ended up acquiring some companies which, which happened to be in, uh, in different clouds. And then they just uh, instantly became uh, multi-cloud uh, companies. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there are different reasons. Uh, and uh, redundancy, as you, as you said, resili resi resiliency, redundancy, high availability, uh, all of that is, uh, is one of the key uh, uh, reasons. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, so they, they're, they're moving towards these type of deployments. Um, maybe they've inherited this because of an acquisition. Um, maybe they, they simply need to do that because they want to use some services and some of the cloud providers or just for resiliency purposes. Now, you know, I know, for example, that a lot of the cloud providers have very different networking constructs. So Google is very different from, say, Azure, AWS, in terms of like how the regions work and how you would kind of um, uh, connect between across different regions. Um, and even if you're just working within one cloud provider, um, you may have be working across different availability zones and across different regions. So what are some of the challenges that you see enterprises encounter when they start to contemplate moving to the cloud? Uh, when you uh, connect to multiple clouds, um, uh, each cloud is very different from when it comes to, as you said, uh, when it comes to the underlying networking construct. Uh, so um, you, uh, as an enterprise or enterprises, uh, they have to learn or they have to have staff which, which knows, uh, which have expertise in each of these clouds or they have to build expertise in each of these clouds. Um, and um, just building that expertise takes uh, time. Um, and nowadays, uh, uh, cloud network is just an extension of your private uh, network. So it's not uh, different from your on-prem or, or your private uh, network. It's just ex extending into the cloud. So you have to be able to run and manage uh, your cloud network similar to the way you're, you're managing and running your, uh, your uh, uh, private network. Uh, um, so you have to uh, make sure that uh, when you deploy your cloud network, it's deployed in a resilient uh, fashion, it's highly available, uh, and you have uh, complete visibility uh, uh, into uh, what's going on into the cloud, across clouds, uh, on-prem to the cloud, cloud to internet, uh, so you have to have visibility is like uh, one of the one of the key aspects of uh, deploying uh, or the uh, is one of the key requirements. And then you have to be able to manage and control um, uh, uh, from routing perspective, from uh, uh, from the routing policies perspective, from in general, the traffic policies perspective, uh, your cloud, the way you you control your uh, on-prem networks. 
Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I was talking to somebody who um, he helped effectively roll out the cloud deployment for a large healthcare provider. And he had mentioned that they, it was really kind of an, an evolution, their rollout. You know, they moved to the cloud, they started um, deploying, and then, you know, they, they kept kind of going down architectural cul-de-sacs where they realized like, oh no, we can't scale that way, or oh no, like that's not gonna work, you know, and then having to make changes. You know, um, cloud networking is not just about like connectivity or providing connectivity into mm-hmm. into the uh, each of the clouds, right? So sometimes that's the easier uh, 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 part of the the whole thing. Uh, it's also about like uh, uh, making sure that uh, uh, you secure the network. You 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 move your maybe in certain cases you move your security services into the cloud as well. Uh, maybe maybe there there are requirements uh, where you need to move your other services into the cloud as well, and um, and then uh, 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 being able to deploy all of this uh, based on the use cases because each use case has like different requirements uh, from uh, what is required from from the from the network perspective as well. So uh, to give you give you an example. Uh, there might be use cases where traffic is going from on-prem to, to the cloud. There might be use cases where there is traffic between clouds or within even one cloud, but between different regions uh, as well. Uh, or there might be uh, a use case where the, there's traffic which is coming in from the internet and it's going into uh, the cloud. Your servers or your applications might be sitting in, inside the cloud. So you might need like different types of services uh, uh, to front end uh, uh, the cloud uh, based on the use cases. Sometimes there are certain things which are very hard to accomplish. Uh, and again, giving you a quick example, if you have stateful, let's say a firewall which you're putting uh, uh, in front, uh, uh, if you have a use case where traffic needs to go through a firewall and then hit your uh, destination or your, uh, 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 wherever your, your application is sitting, um, you might have a requirement where you need to auto scale uh, your uh, stateful services. Uh, in certain cases, you need to make sure that the traffic flows are symmetric uh, and the services scale up and down based on the on the capacity requirements or uh, uh, the load uh, through those uh, services. So all of that makes adds to the complexity. So if you can do all of this in a simple manner in uh, uh, across clouds. Uh, then that's uh, that uh, helps uh, enterprises a lot. Basically, as a, as an enterprise, you don't have to worry about the underlying uh, limitations of the cloud provider's uh, infrastructure because you know, like uh, as an as a customer of the of these uh, clouds, um, uh, every time you spend something up in the cloud from a networking perspective, you you have some limitations which are imposed on on you. Uh, maybe maybe those are number of routes or or some bandwidth limitations. Uh, then you have to like. Uh, take care of all, all of your uh, deployments as far as, uh, let's say if you're going between different regions, like inter-region routing, um, and if you have multiple clouds and inter-cloud, uh, all of that routing, segmentation, um, and nowadays like these, these networks are uh, global in nature. Yeah, and you can't manage what you can't see. So mm-hmm. visibility is so critical, especially if you're in the cloud, um, you don't know what kind of performance you get unless you you know, you validate, you know, that you're getting what you need, for example. Um, So it's just important that even though it's not your infrastructure, you're still using it, you're still responsible for it. So you should know what what you're getting. Really appreciate you coming on to the show. This was really fascinating. Um, Pretty new area. Uh, So glad you could share some of your thoughts on this with our audience. Angelique, that was a really great interview. Um, What did you take away from, you know, your discussion with Atif and that you think, you know, would be worth sharing? Yeah, what was really interesting was um, how Atif talked about really being thoughtful about your specific use case. You know, you may have different requirements depending on, um, you know, business um, unit, depending on um, where users are coming from. So maybe you have traffic that's coming into a cloud provider and you might need to think about um, security in a particular way, like um, a firewall or maybe a load balancer, but maybe not have those requirements for interapp. Um, connectivity, um, really thinking about your deployment 
beyond just connectivity and all of the different services that you might need and the performance requirements that you have because they're gonna vary depending on what your use case is. So really trying to map your use case so that you're not over architecting and you're being thoughtful in terms of the resources that you're using. Um, so that, that was really interesting. Um, you know, it's always about the use case at the end of the day, you know, and context is kind of everything. All right. So that's all we have for this week. Don't forget to subscribe, which will get you a free t-shirt by emailing internet report at thousandeyes.com with your address and size. Also, registration is open for the state of the internet and that's coming up on July 16th, which is next Thursday. So we have a lot of amazing speakers there. Um, Fastly, David Belson from the Internet Society, Verizon. Um, and then we have Angelique too. Angelique's going to be actually um, talking about some really interesting um, data in terms of how the internet's been performing over the last uh, few months. So don't forget to sign up for that. And uh, with that, we will see you next week.